Hello and welcome back to Medcry. Today's video is about urinary incontinence. It is the definition, the types, the causes and the treatment. Urinary incontinence is defined as the inability to hold urine until somebody gets to a toilet. It is often a temporary problem and is always associated with an underlying medical condition or a disease. It is known to occur most common in women than in men and to be specific in older women than in younger women. Urinary incontinence usually makes the victim so to feel so embarrassed in public and it is an inevitable problem with age. Before we continue, let's have a brief overview of the urinary blood anatomy. The urinary bladder is a hollow muscular organ that is situated in your groin region that's behind the pubic symphysis and is covered superiorly and anteriorly by a peritoneum. A peritoneum is a membranous lining covering the abdomen. Posteriorly, the urinary bladder is covered by a vagina and the supravaginal part of the cervix in females. On the side waist, thus laterally, it is bordered by a levator ani muscle and an obturator internus muscle. The urinary bladder receives its blood supply from the superior and the inferior vesicle branches of the internal iliac artery and the vesicle veins drain into the internal iliac vein. Then the nerve supply to the urinary bladder is from the efferent parasympathetic fibers of the S2 S4. Normally during urination, the detrusor muscle or the muscles of the bladder wall contracts. This contraction forces urine out of the bladder into the urethral opening. At the same time, the urethral sphenic muscles that surround the urethra relax, letting out urine to pass through out of the body. Urinary incontinence occurs if the bladder muscles suddenly contract or the muscles surrounding the urethral opening suddenly relax. The specialist nerves in the bladder wall sense that the blood is about to get half full of urine and these nerves send impulses into the spinal cord at the levels of S2 and 3 in an area known as the micturition center and into the pons of the brain. The spinal cord response is part of the micturition reflex. So it causes an increase in the parasympathetic stimulation and a decrease in the sympathetic stimulation which makes the detrusor or the bladder muscles to contract and the internal sphenictus to relax. It also decreases a motor stimulation to the external urethral sphenicta, thus allowing it to relax as well. So at this point, urination will occur if not the pons that comes in. So the pons is usually a region in the brain that we train to voluntarily control this urination process. So, for example, if you want to delay urination, the pons overrides the micturition reflex from the spinal cord, and when we want to urinate, this pons now allows the micturition reflex from the spinal cord reflex to happen or to take place. What are the types of urinary incontinence? We have five types of urinary incontinence, that is the stress incontinence, urge incontinence, functional incontinence, overflow incontinence, and other mixed types of incontinence. To start with, let's have a look at the stress incontinence. Stress incontinence is the most common form of urinary incontinence and is known to occur most commonly in females. Stress incontinence is treatable. So this occurs when there is any issue or a thing that causes an increase in the intra-abdominal pressures, for example coughing, laughing, sneezing or any other movements that put a lot of pressure on the bladder. This causes an involuntary leakage of urine. Stress incontinence can also be associated with other physical changes that result from either pregnancy, delivery, or menopause. Usually, the pelvic floor muscles that support the bladder, if they weaken, the bladder moves downwards, pushing slightly to the bottom of the pelvis towards the vagina in females. Then, this stress incontinence occurs if these muscles that do the squeezing weaken. Stress incontinence is known to worsen during the week before menstrual periods because of a lowered estrogen levels that lead to a lower muscle pressures around the urethral sphenicus, therefore increasing the chances of urinary leakage. And this incidence increases with menopause in females. 
The second type of urinary incontinence is an urge incontinence. An urge incontinence is generated from an overactive or an abnormal involuntary bladder muscle contraction. This contraction results to a urinary leakage in presence of a normally functioning urethral sphincter. A detrusor instability is usually an idiopathic problem. In these patients with detrusor instability, a sensation of urgency occurs first, then it is followed by the initiation of an involuntary bladder control, then finally a urethral relaxation. There are two possible mechanisms for this, one of which is a relative cholinergic denervation of the detrusor or the bladder muscles, and the second mechanism is either the effects of aging on the smooth muscles and the autonomic nervous system. A detrusor hyperreflexion, on the other hand, is a condition of an, an inhibited detrusor contraction in the presence of a neurologic lesion or a problem in the suprasacrospinal cord or the central nervous system, for example, spinal cord injury, Parkinson's disease, dementias, and in neoplasias or cancers. So, a spinal cord injuries interrupt the sacral reflex arc from the suprasacrospinal cord cerebral cortex and higher centers. So these pathways are normally crucial for the voluntary and involuntary inhibition of urination. In the initial phase of the spinal cord injury, the bladder is usually a reflexic and the overflow incontinence occurs. But later on, a detrusor hyperreflexia will occur. This detrusor hyperreflexia may be triggered by a specific event, for example, coughing, a changes in posture, or a changes in the speed of bladder filling, orgasm, or an anticipation to voiding. The third type of urinary incontinence is a functional incontinence. People who have a functional incontinence are the ones who have problems either in thinking moving or communicating which prevent them from either reaching the toilet. For example, in a person with Alzheimer's disease, for example, he or she may not think well to plan a timely trip to the restroom to urinate. So a person on a wheelchair, on the other hand, may be blocked from getting to a toilet in time. Most of these conditions are associated with age and account for some incontinences of most elderly women in nursing homes overflow incontinence. In overflow incontinence, the blood is always full so that it frequently leaks out urine. So a weak bladder muscles or a broken urethra can cause this type of incontinence. And then sometimes nerve damage as a result of diabetes mellitus or other diseases may weaken these bladder muscles or tumors and other urinary stones may block the urethras and overflow incontinence are a rare type of incontinence in women. Then the last type of urinary incontinence is this either mixed or a transient type. In mixed type of incontinence, it is an occurrence of a stress and urge incontinence together. A transient type of incontinence is a leakage which occurs temporarily because of a condition that will eventually pass, for example, in infection and medications. What are the causes of incontinence? There is no any single etiologic factor that can be implicated in each case of urinary incontinence, but urinary incontinence is a multifactorial problem. So structural and functional disorders that involve the bladder, the urethra, the ureters, and the surrounding connective tissues may contribute to the development of urinary incontinence. Some factors that contribute to it are, for example, old age, a female sex, cultural female genital mutilations, clonic malnutrition, some remote access to maternal facilities, hysterectomy procedures, smoking, childbirth-related neuromuscular and connective tissue damages to the pelvic floor that occur because of a prolonged labor or a prolonged second stage of labor, either some episiotomies or perineal lacerations, and in other cases, instrument deliveries. Obesity is known to other factors include obesity, chronic cough, a chronic constipation, spinal cord injuries or congenital spinal cord disorders, 
central nervous system disorders for example multiple sclerosis parkinson's disease and metabolic problems for example in diabetes mellitus which is the most common some medications are known to cause urinary incontinence for example alpha blockers which cause retention and overflow and then we have angiotensin to the converting enzyme inhibitors which are associated with a chronic cough if a person has a history of a previous incontinence surgery or a surgery for fistula or a urethral diverticular a urinary tract, tract infections especially in postmenopausal women a radiation injury to the bladder and urinary tract stones neuroplasms or cancers or an fallen bodies can be also associated with development of urinary incontinence then what's the clinical evaluation when a person or a patient comes in with a urinary incontinence in this case a clinician will take an obstetric and gynecologic history a urogenital, neurologic, and surgical and a medical history which is directed to any type of the incontinence. For example, you need to take note of the parity of these women, the difficulty in deliveries of the previous pregnancies, a genital prolapse, an history of hysterectomy or a vaginal repair, spinal cord injuries, presence of multiple sclerosis or a stroke, or these neurogenic problems, for example, Parkinson's disease, dementia and central nervous system neoplasias or cancers diabetes mellitus cerebrovascular problems chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases which are associated with again chronic cough constipation history radiation and the use of medicines for example beta blockers and alcohol use and then the hallmark sign of uh, involuntary leakage of urine the hallmark sign or a symptom in urinary incontinence is an involuntary leakage of urine. So from the clinical presentation, you can obtain the duration of the complaint and the severity of the urine loss. You also need to know the frequencies, the episodes of uh, this involuntary urinary leakage, the episodes, painful urination or a presence of hematurias. And then you need to figure out the triggering factors of these events, for example, cough, laughter, a change in postures, orgasm or anticipation of voiding, or maybe lifting of heavy weights. Then, after, after conducting a good history taking, you need to do a general examination for any edemas, neurologic abnormalities, mobility problems, and cognition. You need to do an abdominal examination, pelvic and rectal examination, which are so important here, examination of the back and lower limbs, and in specific tests that you need to do in a patient with urinary incontinence is you do a urethral hypomotility test using a cortisol swab test, stress testing, those are to just confirm the stress incontinence, martial bony test. How do we grade urinary incontinence? Urinary incontinence can be graded into five grades. That is grade zero, grade one, two, three, and four. In grade zero, these patients will just come continent. They don't have this urinary incontinence. Grade one, there's a loss of urine with sudden increase in any abdominal pressures, but not in bed at night. In grade two, the incontinence worsens with a lesser degree of physical stress. And grade three is an incontinence with walking, standing erect from a sitting position or sitting up in bed. And then the last grade, which is grade four, there's total incontinence, which occurs and the urine is lost without relation to any physical activity or any position. Then the laboratory test that may be required in cases of urinary incontinence examination and urinalysis to assess for any associated problems, for any maturias, pyurias, or glycosuria, a urine culture, a blood test, renal function, imaging studies, are important in the examination of urinary incontinence. For example, an ultrasound study can reveal hydronephrosis or hydrourethas or presence of urinary tract stones or any tumors. When performing this ultrasound, you can also know the post void or residual volume of urine. Blood wall thickness determinants to screen for diabetic insipidus and observations for the effect of blood volume or blood and egg anatomies. A fluoroscopy scan and video urodynamics and then a cystoeurotography is one of the useful scans in diagnosing urinary tract fistulas 
A chain bead cystography is useful in the detection of ureter and bladder neck mobility and a posterior urethrophysical angles. A magnetic resonance imaging is uh, known to be useful in studying pelvic floor muscles and the ligaments, for example, levator animuscles, bulbourethral ligaments, and the compressor urethrae. They can demonstrate an increased descent and rotation of the bladder neck in the continent females. Also, an MRI can diagnose the size and location of a urethral diverticula if present. So, the diagnostic procedures here, like we say, is a sister urethroscopy, urodynamic studies, urophilometry, systolometry, a valsavalic point pressures, part testing and a paper tile testing. You can do a pissary trial, a cotton swap or cough chest test, and some provocative maneuvers, for example, sound and sight of running waters and washing, coughing, or heel bouncing are used commonly in this detrosa instability testing. What is the available treatment of urinary incontinence? The treatment of urinary incontinence encompasses three main goals. That is the lifestyle interventions, behavioral interventions, and pharmacologic intervention. So we aim to improve the obstetrica to minimize any childbirth complications that may predispose most females into development of urinary incontinence. A proper avoiding habits is part of the lifetime modification of behavior interventions, a timed urination, frequent voiding, and bladder retraining exercise, for example, QGL exercises, anti-incontinence devices, and some pharmacologic treatment, and also we can have a surgical treatment. In treating stress incontinence, we can use pelvic floor muscles and vaginal cones. The kidal exercises help to strengthen the tone of the pelvic floor muscles, and the vaginal cones are weighted devices which are designed to increase the, the strength of the pelvic floor muscles. And in the pelvic floor, electrical stimulations using either vaginal anal probe, contraction of the elevator man causes a contraction of the elevator anal muscles. And occlusive devices, for example, an incontinence dish pissary can be used to mimic the effects of a retropubic urethroplexy, like in this image. The pharmacologic treatment that is used in a treatment of urinary incontinence works by increasing the sphincter or the peripheral flow muscle strength or relax the bladder. This drug can be used in all kinds of incontinence, but they are most important and useful in urge incontinence. For example, in stress incontinence, we can use alpha adrenergic agonist, which can be used to strengthen the smooth muscles, for example, fedrin and pseudofedrin, and vaginoestrogen rings, known as the ACE ring, is inserted in the vagina every three months. And in urge incontinence, we use anticholinergic agents, for example, propanthaline, bromide, or uh, toteridine. Uh, blocking cholinergic receptors in the bladder to increase bladder capacities. We can also inhibit voluntary contraction of the bladders and also delay the initial urge to void. Antispasmodic agents, which have anticholinergic effects and low cholinergic properties, for example, flavoxate and Dicyclomide can also be used. In management of mixed incontinence, tricyclic antidepressants help in uh, relaxing the bladder muscles, the detrusor muscle, and increase the retrospinicular tone. And they're used for nocturia and nocturnal neuresis. The most commonly used drug here is imipramine, which is the most widely used uh, for urologic indications at a dose of uh, 25 mg, two to four times a day. And some surgeries are used for genuine stress incontinence to stabilize the bladder neck and a proximal urethra. So there are six basic surgical procedures with the bladder batteries operations, retropubic operations, bladder neck suspension, sling procedures, periurethral injections and artificial urinary sphincters.